Almost three years now since Portland Street Response launched in Portland. The program sends a mental health counselor and paramedic to certain 911 calls instead of police. The pilot program started in the Lentz neighborhood of Southeast Portland in February of 2021, and now it's expanded citywide. Portland Street Response was conceived under former Portland City Commissioner Joanne Hardesty, who was in charge of Portland Fire and Rescue at the time, and where the administration of Portland Street Response now resides. The question is, is it working? And does it have enough support from city leadership to keep it going? Here to address those questions, Stephanie Sullivan, Acting Deputy Chief of Community Health for the Portland Fire Bureau, within the Bureau's Medical Services and Training Division, which includes Portland Street Response, the CHAT program, CHAT stands for Community Health Assess and Treat, and the newly formed Overdose Response Team, which is within CHAT. Stephanie Sullivan, thanks for joining Eye on Northwest Politics. Thank you for having me. Well, first of all, I want to mention to the viewers that we had also planned to have Layla Layton, Interim Program Manager for Portland Street Response, on the program. She was not able to be with us, so thank you for being here. Absolutely. First of all, we had a major weather event this past week. You heard yes, me we mention did. about the governor's emergency declaration. Uh, what did that mean for Portland Street Response and the other medical programs under the Portland Fire Bureau? Sure. Well, I know um, Portland Street Response response and our chat teams worked incredibly hard over this time. Um, they coordinated really closely with our county partners to help those people who are out in the streets get to warming shelters um, and help help make some connections with folks out there that are in the communities that were either underprepared or that didn't have enough clothing, they didn't have appropriate shelters, and also talk to them about um, where we could get some, them some medical treatment that wasn't the ER. The ER was absolutely overwhelmed with people who had been injured. They had, were dealing with their own issues with um, some flooding, some generator issues. So our crews were able to talk to people and give them some other alternatives to help alleviate some of the strain on the EMS system. But it, it was incredibly challenging for all the crews, for AMR, for Portland Fire, for our engines, for our chat teams, and for Portland Street Response. They all did heroic efforts out there. Did you get more calls than you normally would without this event? I think the last I had heard, it was um, probably the number one highest volume of calls mm -hmm. ever into BOAC. Our, we have three times the average uh, call day on, I think, just on Saturday alone. All right. Well, according to your data dashboard, uh, PSR responded to about 850 calls mm -hmm. in December of mm -hmm. 2023. Uh, you had a peak in 2023 of about uh, 1,270. That was in August last mm -hmm. year. Uh, were most of those calls people in mental health crisis? You know, we, uh, the calls come from a variety of different things. Our calls are from folks who are in um, mental health crisis. They're also calls for people who need services. So one of the things that our crews do is if you don't have um, a regular phone and you have a 911 only phone and you need to be connected to services, our crews will go out and help connect you to services, whether it's food, shelter, sobering detox centers. Um, that's what our crews do. They're, they're a bridge helping folks who, are, um, who have this gap in critical services find what they need. So it's, they do both of those. Um, I don't have the exact numbers as to how many were mental health related calls um, because the way we're dispatched out, we're dispatched on a PSR call type versus a... Um, uh, when we use ProQA for our EMS calls. And so we know which ones are behavioral calls, which ones are just a fall, or which one is a cardiac arrest. How is that triaged? I mean, when a call comes in, mm -hmm. how do you determine whether it's police, fire, or Portland Street response? Well, I, I can't go to all the specifics because I've never worked in BOAC, but I can tell you that BOAC has a protocol and it is different um, if it's a PSR call and it's a behavioral health call and it meets our requirements. They can't be suicidal, they can't have a weapon, they can't be indoors. Um, then they can actually dispatch it out as a PSR call type. And we have a, a specific queue that is just for PSR that they will hold a call there for. And our, um, our supervisors go through that queue and they will dispatch them to the crews and who will also self-monitor calls. Is it ever the case that, say, uh, police get a call and mm -hmm. they determine that this would be better handled by Portland Street Response? Absolutely. Yeah. We work really closely with police and um, often collaborate with the behavioral health unit 
frequently. Um, so we do co-response as well as we do alternative response. So there'll be times police will get a call and they will think this is actually more, uh, more appropriate for Portland street response and they'll call and they'll request our crews to go instead of them. And then there's also times that they will go and they will ask for us to co-respond with them. Okay, so there are times when uh, Portland Street Response, for example, will be on a call with Portland Police, yeah. and then you determine how to handle that. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of what we do is this service connection, um, and so that's when we when we meet with pol uh, police and we routinely meet with them, we talk about service coordination for some of our clients with some really complex needs. Um, and, and so then that way it makes it easier. We've got this rapport built, we've got this trust. So then when the time comes for either a co-response or an alternate response, it's really easy to, to do the handoff between the two bureaus. Now, what's your budget and how much staff are you working with with Portland Street Response? So right now we have about 41 people um, and our budget is, um, it comes from general fund and it comes from some one-time funding with ARPA money, uh, cannabis funds, um, so and the opioid settlement funds. But the lion's share of our funding right now is from one-time funding. Okay, and, and so what's your total budget? The total budget, I'd have to double check with you, but it's between eight and 10 million. Okay. I don't have the exact number on that one. Okay, and with the one-time funding, uh, I've read that it could go up to 12 million, uh, about 12 and a half. I don't have that exact okay. number. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, for the majority of people that Portland Street Response contacts, uh, what, what do you do with them? I mean, what, yeah. uh, when, when you have that one-on-one -on -one contact with a person, you make your assessment out in the field, mm -hmm. then what happens at that point? Thank you for asking that because I think this is a question that a lot of people have ideas about what we should be doing, but what we can do is different. So what we do with Portland Street Response is we have a human connection with people. So as a first responder in fire, there's always, you go, you, um, you fix the problem and you move on to the next call. Portland Street Response, it takes a little bit longer. We sit with the client and we find out what the root of the problem is. And sometimes we can fix it immediately. Sometimes we can give them some snacks, we can give them some ramen, we can give them an ear, somebody to talk to. Sometimes it's making a service connection, getting them to a location. Sometimes those service connections aren't there. But oftentimes what it really is, is letting people still feel like they're a part of society because there's still that human connection and that piece where you have someone who will sit there and they'll actually talk to you for an hour. Mm -hmm. The program went citywide in March of 2022, but you're not 24 seven. Correct. Why not? Well, there was a really big push for us to expand quickly. And it was a really big push, but we didn't have the structure. We are still building the plane as we're flying it, really. So what we have done now is we're working on stabilizing the program, getting policies in place, getting training in place. And I don't feel like it's a really responsible thing for us to do to expand really rapidly without having ongoing funding. We have to have secure funding. We've got to have stability before we can rapidly expand. Uh, you talked about funding. We mm -hmm. had uh, City Commissioner Renee Gonzalez, who oversees public safety, mm -hmm. including Portland Fire and therefore Portland Street Response on this program recently. Uh, he hasn't always agreed with what Portland Street Response has done in the past. And he suggested that Street Response should be mostly funded by Multnomah County, since Multnomah County is in charge of community health. So mm -hmm. take a listen to this. This is what he said. Mm -hmm. These are areas that statutorily are the county's responsibility, and the Joint Office on Homelessness is specifically set up to address these issues with respect to our unsheltered population. Uh, PSR is a wonderful program, an innovative program, but it is, its primary beneficiaries are those on our streets. And uh, I, don't, I think it is something that the Joint Office on Homelessness should be supporting. Uh, considering that, uh, does that make you concerned about the future funding of Portland Street Response? No, it doesn't really, because what universally I hear from everybody, from senators, from legislators, from people in the county, from people in the city, is everybody is supportive of this program. But right now, we just need to figure out how to get some of the politics out of it and how to just 
get the support into it and really just support the program. I know it will be funded. We just have to get through some of these barriers. So we have some significant um, bottlenecks to getting some of this funding that people think is easy to get, like the Medicaid funding. It seems like it's one that would be a really easy um, grab for us to get that money and to be able to utilize that for ongoing funding for the program. But there are some, there are some issues with us with, um, and some barriers that we have to overcome to be able to actually get access to that funding. One of which, as you had said before, is the 24-7. You know, so this is this is part of the issue with that. The other is, you know, there's some difficulties with um, demographics. We have to be able to get demographics from folks to be able to recoup these Medicaid funds. And people who are in crisis, behavioral health crisis, a drug addicted crisis, or are just, you know, on the streets and not really connected with the community, it's hard to get those demographics from them, from their name, their date of birth, their social security number during these moments of crisis. All of those make it really hard for us to get that Medicaid dollar. So we need to figure out how to remove those barriers so we can access that funding. Stick around. Uh, we'll continue our conversation after the break, including uh, a report from the Portland Auditor's Office on Portland Street Response, what that audit found, and uh, we'll have the reaction next on Ion Northwest Politics.